Have you ever wondered what it might be like to be raised as a missionary kid? Have you considered how you and your church might support MKs in the transitions that they experience? That's the focus of our topic today on this episode of the Global Missions Podcast. Welcome to the Global Missions Podcast, a podcast for Christ followers who want to participate more effectively in God's work both at home and to the ends of the earth. Visit us at globalmissionspodcast.com to find show notes, resources, and previous episodes. Here's your host, Rob Magwood, better known to his friends as Mags. Hi, everyone. We're glad that you've joined us again as we continue to discover how to participate in global missions more effectively. I'm your host, Mags, and I'm looking forward to today's expert interview. It's a powerful discussion as we talk about missionary kids and how we can love and support and encourage them. Our expert guest is himself an MK, Paul Dyke, and he leads the Canadian Missionary Kid Network. Just before we get to that interview, we want to share with you this missions resource. How will you ring in the new year? You could be at Urbana, worshipping and learning with 16,000 people who desire to learn about God's work in the world and how they can be a part of His Kingdom work. Urbana is hosted in St. Louis, Missouri from December 27th to 31st. Visit urbana.org to register today. And now, here's our interview with today's expert guest. Well, hello again, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's expert interview. Our guest is Paul Dyke. And for those of you that haven't met Paul, I'd just like to introduce him briefly to you. Paul serves with Outreach Canada, where his primary role is providing support for missionary kids and also cares for their families. Paul leads the Canadian Missionary Kid Network. He himself is an MK and was uh, raised in India near the Nepalese border, and he now lives in Abbotsford with his wife. Paul, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Max. Great to have you with us. Just before we jump into our topic today, could you just give us a brief backstory? Uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be passionate about missions and especially about MKs. Thank you. Uh, I was born on the border of uh, Nepal and India, right up in the Himalayas. Um, Born to uh, missionary parents. My parents were with WEC. And uh, they placed or they gave me a deep love for the Lord. Uh, They introduced me to Jesus at an early age. Mm. I found that I had a a deep love for the people of India and Nepal, of Tibet, of Sikkim, the the surrounding countries, uh, the developing countries. We were in a minority, and we learned to live as people in the minority, yet we had such a deep love. And I witnessed my dad showing love to particularly the people that he was ministering to. And that love transferred over to me, and it's, it stands today, 60 mm-hmm. years later. Mm-hmm. And have you lived in Canada for a long time now? Yes, uh, for the last uh, almost 50 years. Mm-hmm. And have you had a chance to be back to that area in Nepal? It took me 40 years to return. I uh, was involved with business and pastoring and mm-hmm. uh, returning for uh, an MK to, uh, to our home country is a huge gift. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I've been back uh, about five or six times okay. in the last uh, 10 years. Very good. Okay. Well, we appreciate you uh, spending the time with us and to share some of your experience and especially about the ministry you're involved in now. I, I'll begin with a simple question. You yourself are an MK, a missionary kid. What are some of the highlights of being an MK? You have a beautiful view of the world. You see the world in the brilliant color that it is. You smell the smells. You meet the people, you taste the food, you live in the poverty that most of the world lives in, and it's home. Mm. And it's a gift that I would wish on anybody and everybody. You do not regret growing up in a different culture because it, it's, 
it's your home culture. It feels home. Mm -hmm. um, yet you have the privilege of traveling to another country, your passport country, Canada in my case. Mm -hmm. You get to see many other countries on route. And typically your worldview is impacted heavily by uh, so many different cultures, so many different values, uh, and a deep love for the Lord Jesus. Wow, what a beautiful uh, expression. I, I love the positive and optimistic story that you tell with those descriptions. Sometimes I think that those of us in the West who, who live in the West and we think about sending families uh, overseas particularly and to areas that are relatively uh, less rich or less comfortable, that we're, we're imposing a hardship on families and on children. You paint a very different picture. So many people are fearful mm -hmm. of uh, growing up in a country uh, because safety in Canada is huge. It's a huge value for us. Yes. Yet uh, the exposure to what goes on in different countries uh, is a beautiful experience. Mm -hmm. And we get to see God firsthand deliver in ways that typically we don't see in North America. We are quite self-sufficient, or we think we are. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't mean that in any derogatory sense. It's just we have a lot of wealth, and we are used to going through our day mm -hmm. without having to deeply depend on God for our next meal, for our next relationship. Mm -hmm. And so witnessing in your parents that kind of lifestyle and then learning that in your own way uh, transferring that into your lifestyle and as an adult um, is a huge gift. You you treasure and you value uh, what you have, particularly relationships. Yes, yes. You know, something else I just um, observe as we get going here. It's helpful as you use this vocabulary. You mentioned a passport country. Um, sometimes those of us who are in a sending nation like Canada will send a family away to serve in another area. Their family returns to Canada and we will ask the kids, and this is well-intentioned, are you glad to be home? Right. And, and really that's a, I mean, it would be wonderful to unpack that idea, but passport country is a great way we find to, re, to honor these kids and realize that their home may not be here in Canada. Uh, their home is somewhere else, as you've described, but this is their passport country. Uh, right. It seems like a very helpful uh, expression. Yes. It's, it's something that we as MKs wear proudly. We're proud to be Canadian. Mm. Uh, a number of the MKs, as we go through the reentry retreat this week, uh, share that they have three passports. Uh, some have lived in five or six countries. And so uh, home actually uh, is quite wide. And Canada is now becoming home because this is where they're going to live for the next few years. Right, right. But yes, this is a passport country. Yeah. You've mentioned some highlights of being an MK. I wonder on the other side, misconceptions or mistaken ideas that we may have about the MK experience. Could you comment, how do we not get it right? Uh, quite often we look at MKs. Um, having grown up in another country as weird. Now, actually, in many ways, that's correct because they have grown up as we call MKs hidden immigrants mm. in that they look like Canadians, but they really are Indian or Nepal mm. Nepalese or Zimbabwean mm -hmm. at heart. And um, so uh, their customs, their colloquialisms, uh, their ways of walking and talking and engaging are quite different than our Canadian ways. And so um, it is a different, it, it's weird in some cases. Uh, another misconception is that it's poor MK. You've missed so much by living overseas. Mm. You've lived in poverty and we feel really bad for you. And it's meant well. Mm -hmm. uh, MKs by and large don't feel that way. They feel very rich uh, because uh, for several reasons. One, overseas MKs are typically some of the wealthiest people in the neighborhood, even though by Canadian standards we would be flat broke. Mm. Uh, but uh, the richness of relationships, the richness of experience, yes. uh, cross-cultural experiences is huge. MKs almost entirely do not feel disadvantaged by their MK experience. And almost without exception, MKs do not want to give up 
their MK experience. They're, they're glad they had it. And if they had to do it all over again, they would. Mm-hmm. One of the things, and you've mentioned this already, that is um, a major feature or factor in an MK's life is transition. Yes. Um, ministry terms overseas uh, vary in length very broadly. Now, there's no single standard for a term of service overseas, but it means departing from a passport country, arriving in another country, and returning. How does transition affect these these kids, both positively and negatively? Mm, phenomenal question. Um, transition is a very difficult thing, yet it's a strengthening uh, aspect in our lives. It has made MKs more resilient. They are used to dealing with change, and they're used to dealing with ambiguity. And so that's a strengthening factor for their adult life, their work life, their relational life, their married life, if they get married. One of the things that uh, in transition you learn to do is you say goodbye and emotions run high. So grief is a big aspect or a big part of an MK's life. And sometimes they don't even have the time to deal with the grief that they feel. And so it kind of is a pent up emotion that sometimes just bursts out like a flood and you wonder where that came from. But it's a, a series of goodbyes. Um, I think it is the average number of moves for an MA is eight by the time they're 18. And quite often, those eight moves are intercountry moves. Mm-hmm. And so uh, you say goodbye to friends that you've grown up with, spent a few years with, thinking, I probably will never see mm-hmm. these people again, uh, which translates to a lifelong friend is seems to be hard to come by for an MK. And there that deep sense of trust that you have with a, a fellow, a friend, a, a deep relationship that you've had ever since kindergarten days. Mm-hmm. And, and here I am, you know, 60. Well, my kindergarten days and my early childhood days are in India, and I don't have those friends anymore. So transition comes with quite a price. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, at this point, I'm just going to make a special invitation here for a minute, uh, Paul. I'm going to invite yes. um, Rebecca, our producer, to join us. She's listening, of course, to this. And Rebecca is herself an MK. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rebecca, you come on the line here for just a minute. I'd like to ask you about transition in your life. Um, and how it's affected you, just give us an idea, verifying these ideas in your experience, positive and negative to the transitions that you've experienced. Yeah. um, As Paul was talking, I identified with a lot of the things he said, and I think particularly when you are school age, that transition seems big and um, can be painful as your friends come and go. Even, I mean, you have your furlough cycle, but not all your best friends that don't have the same furlough cycle as you. So you sort of have a new best friend every year going through your your school experience. Whereas um, when I first moved to Canada in grade 10, I went to a school in a small town where everyone had been together since kindergarten. Mm. And so uh, it, it ended up being a very positive experience. And I still have very good friends from that time. Um, but there's definitely times where you sort of envy that stability that they've had. And yet, as an adult, I see I'm just, I've become very adept to change and very good at landing in a place and settling in and making it home and meeting people Mm -hmm. um, that I think perhaps those who haven't moved quite as frequently or maybe don't have. And so Mm -hmm. um, I I definitely would not have, I would not give up my MK experience. Mm. I'm glad to hear you say that, too. Thanks for sharing some of your story. Uh, Rebecca uh, grew up or spent a good part of her uh, childhood in Africa and mentioned coming to Canada as uh, a teenager. So, Paul, um, what are some of the biggest hurdles that MKs face as they move back to their passport nation? And whether you have in mind kind of that furlough period for a year or something while mom and dad are back, or when they're transitioning maybe at college time or university uh, for a more, uh, you know, a longer term transition, maybe even permanent. Yes, I'll take it in two stages. The furlough, the home missions assignment, 
quite often MKs, uh, knowing that they're only here for a short while, uh, can tend to not look to build deep relationships because they know they're leaving shortly. It's, uh, it's kind of a temporary home. It's kind of like taking a holiday or even the reverse short-term missions trip. This one's to Canada instead of to India. And so um, the opportunity to check out or just to see this as a bit of a holiday exists. I'm not saying all MKs do that, but that's one of the hurdles because they find saying goodbye so hard and they know that they're going to be gone shortly. Mm-hmm. Now, the the long-term transition to Canada, typically for school, mm-hmm. or if the missionary family is coming back permanently, even if they are in grade school or secondary school, um, they face quite a transition period for a number of reasons. Even such simple things as understanding cultural norms, uh, the idioms in language, Mm -hmm. the slang, what's an appropriate word and and what's inappropriate. And so quite often an MK will feel embarrassed because they haven't quite caught the memo Mm. on what to say, what not to say in certain things. Mm -hmm. Um, They might find that some of the things that we just take for granted, like filling up your gas tank, that is... An experience that seems very weird. Uh, What are reward points or reward cards? They might just be sitting at a gas station staring at the tank Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because some of those things are just news to them. Uh, Building relationships. MKs tend to build relationships and go deep very quickly. Mm. If you're talking to an MK for more than 15 or 20 minutes, you might have heard some very deep personal things already. Mm -hmm. Whereas in our Western culture, it takes a lot longer. We we tend to have small talk for quite a while before we go deep. The problem with going deep quickly is sometimes MKs uh, have not learned who to trust. Mm. And so they end up trusting the wrong people with deep and innermost thoughts, particularly when they have such a love for developing nation people. Mm-hmm. And so the immigrant who they take a shine to, they love because they've grown up in their country mm-hmm. or just because they're an immigrant and they, they feel they feel their pain. Mm-hmm. And so they may take them into their uh, confidence at a, at a deeper level than maybe they should have at such a, a quick time and it will cost them. Wow. Another concern is the parents staying overseas, mm-hmm. the MK coming back to study, no family close by. It's just one of those really difficult times. No place to go for special events like Christmas, Easter, birthdays. No place to store your junk at uh, between school years. Mm -hmm. Uh, No place to call home. Uh, So those are a few things. Mm -hmm. Um, Paul, what are some of the practical ways? It's leading naturally out of some of the challenges these MKs face, but what are some of the practical ways that we can help? There are those of us in churches here in their passport country who would like to somehow help them and bless them. What are some ways that we can do that effectively? Uh, thank you. What, what you're doing right now is one of the biggest pieces. Uh, awareness, mm. understanding. Um, MKs coming off the field with their family or without experience depression, grief, and anxiety in much higher levels than their North American peers. Uh, and so helping them through the transition well equips them for the future. So one of the ways we do that is we provide a re-entry retreat for MKs. A study out of Biola in 2011 uh, showed that depression, grief, and anxiety much higher, but after they had gone through a re-entry retreat, it was actually lower than their peers who were going into the university's colleges or post-secondary work uh, gap year. Mm -hmm. And so for the church, the families in the church to have an awareness of what they're facing and to be helpful in uh, supporting them through uh, what they're facing, either by uh, coming alongside them as a family, uh, either by supporting them uh, in a sponsorship uh, to attend a reentry retreat, mm-hmm. uh, maybe even just to get them involved in a practical way in their community, at the church, uh, in their home. Um, just connecting them in and helping them through that awkward, I don't feel at home stage. Mm-hmm. 
Now, you mentioned a retreat, and I know that even as we record this, you're in the midst of one of these retreats in Ontario, Canada. Could you just describe for us quickly what what the goal of the retreat is, uh, how long it is, and, and just what that what this project looks like this week for you? Yes, thank you. The goal is to help MKs who have recently repatriated to Canada to acculturate well, to land well, to come to understand more about this country, to um, acculturate into uh, the church, the community, the university campus. So we purposely host this on a Bible college campus. Um, The length is uh, seven days, so it gives them lots of time for interaction and relationship. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest gifts that the MKs receive by attending this reentry retreat is deep and lasting friendships with fellow MKs. And Mm -hmm. we find that those friendships go real deep within about two to three hours. And within about the first day, it looks like everybody's known each other for at least four or five years. Wow. Within the week, we've done a number of physical exercises. We've done a fair bit of teaching, usually the full morning and part of the afternoon. Mm -hmm. We we focus on such things as identity, both spiritual and relational. Mm -hmm. We help them unpack who they are, who God has made them. Uh, We focus on grief and loss. And then into such practical things as finances, banking accounts, insurance, uh, how to do a budget. Mm. Uh, We've had uh, an MK uh, police with the Kitchener police come in and explain safety, uh, both on the highways, in the university campuses, as well as, um, of course, the drug, the alcohol. Mm. We've had a... uh, a man with uh, an alcoholic, mm-hmm. uh, he's a recovering alcoholic, mm-hmm. he came in and spoke on addictive behaviors. Uh, he's been dry now for 14 years. Mm-hmm. He's, he spoke not only about addict, addictions, but how to deal with those addictions and what resources were available in Canada. Mm-hmm. So by the time they have finished a reentry retreat, they have new friends, they have access to a host of resources. Mm-hmm. They have uh, a stronger understanding of Canadian culture, and they're much better equipped to enter work or post-secondary education. Mm. Who can participate in this? As people hear this, who is it open to? Uh, Any and every MK that is uh, between the ages of 17 and 20. Uh, We do have uh, some expansion on those ages. Uh, For instance, we have... MKs that are coming that are between 17 and 20, but they have a younger sibling Mm -hmm. or an older sibling. Mm -hmm. And we find that both are quite interested in coming and both feel like they need it, the younger and the older. We are hoping to, in the near future, offer a dual track so that we can focus on the ages 12 through 16. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because uh, another topic we we deal with is relationships, Mm -hmm. dating, sex, and how the Western culture focuses on those subjects versus the country they've just come from. Right. And so uh, some of those uh, delicate topics, we want to approach them in different ways for different ages. Mm-hmm. They don't have to be affiliated with any specific mission agency that, that is affiliated with the Canadian Missionary Kid Network. Mm-hmm. They're, they're welcome to be a part of this as long as they are repatriating to Canada. Wonderful. Wonderful. Now, uh, as far as resources and cost goes, what's the cost for this? I ask both because there may be MK families who, or who have MKs would like to know about this and what the cost is, but maybe there's a possibility for sponsorships as well. Yes, both are needed. The cost, the overall cost is uh, $1,100. The registration fee is $475. And then what we seek to do is uh, raise funds to um, raise the balance of the $625. Mm -hmm. We we find some mission agencies will support partially Mm -hmm. or completely. We find churches want to get involved and support partially. Quite often the family will pay the registration fee and then some of their supporting churches Mm -hmm. and or the mission agency will, will support the rest. And then there are a number that just have no access to additional resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, we support raise Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. um, beyond um, their organization and their contacts. We support race across Canada for those that can't. Uh, this year we have 41 uh, missionary kids attending uh, in both of the locations combined. Wonderful. Well, that's something we also want to ed- excuse me, educate people about and uh, invite them to consider um, contributing toward. Uh, they may know an MK or they may just simply know that there are MKs out there. And if you are able to help, um, by the end of the show, we'll have all the information uh, that you'll need to contact Paul. Paul, let me ask this. If you think that MKs had an opportunity to address Canadians as they're coming home to their passport country, Canada in this case, and they wanted to say something to help people understand them, what would they want to say to us? I think they'd start by saying thank you. Uh, They're very much aware that uh, their overseas experience, their life overseas, has been as a result of God's generosity through hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people. They would want the opportunity to share their story, and they'd like to share it in detail. Uh, They'd like to talk about what they love about their country, and they'd love to share about why they'd want you to come in and see their country. They'd want to um, invite you to consider becoming part of the work that they're invested in in their country. Now, I say they're invested. It's really their parents Mm -hmm. that, that are the workers, yet... So often the parents involve the children in practical ways. And, of course, children are the most, the best way of getting to know neighbors Mm -hmm. and uh, getting involved in community. Uh, We find that uh, missionary kids that have repatriated well, landed well, Mm -hmm. become our future missiologists, our future missionaries, our future uh, caregivers, leaders, and not just overseas, Mm -hmm. but here in in Canada as well. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, I know that we have just scratched the surface, so to speak, of a very important topic here. This has been very helpful. If our listeners want to learn more about what you're doing with regard to Reboot, that's the retreat for the MKs or the resources you offer, Paul, where can they learn more about this? We have a website uh, that is canadianmk.net. And on that website, they'll have access to a few videos, some pictures, resources, They are welcome to contact me uh, on my email address uh, through phone, and I'll connect them with local resources in their community, in their province, in their city. I'll introduce them to people that are aware of the ministry. And one other uh, thing that we offer is over time, we come to uh, various cities across Canada to uh, share about MKs and their families, Mm -hmm. what the experience looks like, what they feel like, what what transition looks like, and how the church can support the family and the MKs. So we actually bring that to the church to to help them, to equip them, uh, so that as they care for their own missionaries, as they send their own missionaries, they are are better equipped. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, Now, you've given the the web address, will they find your email address and phone number on the website there, Paul? My email address is pdyke, P-D-Y-C-K, at outreach.ca, and my phone number is 778-549-6063. Okay, thank you for sharing that, and thank you for spending this time with us today. Um, just such an important topic, and I think it uh, it will ring with many of our listeners. Certainly, we want churches to be well informed, and not just having good intentions to help, but being better equipped to help. What a great uh, ministry service you're helping to provide, Paul. Thank you for the privilege, and thank you for the joy of working together. We hope you found today's interview to be both informative and inspiring. If you missed anything or would like to check out the resources or links mentioned during the interview, you can find the show notes we've prepared at our website, globalmissionspodcast.com. You can also use the website or our Facebook page to suggest a particular topic or expert you'd like to hear featured on this program. The Global Missions Podcast is co-sponsored by the Jaffrey Centre for Global Initiatives and SEND International of Canada. Thanks for listening in. I'm your host, Megs, 
and I invite you to join us again in two weeks when we'll continue to explore this grand adventure of being Christ's witnesses to the ends of the earth.